a uh, couple of non game issues before or uh, opportunities. Um, there were some special things. The buddy walk, the real grand down syndrome buddy walk that uh, happened at three o'clock on Santa Ana baseball field. And thank you to coach Brown and the event staff for setting that and helping with them. Um, it was a record breaking day for the real grand down syndrome network uh, fundraiser. $128,000 uh, was raised from the buddy walk, uh, which was awesome. Jude Modest, Mike Modest's son, uh, who's a Lobo fan, Jude Modest's team, who's one year old, uh, I forget how old, I believe he's just two years, three years old, is their team won the recognition for having the largest team of 96 people. We had another team, uh, but I believe it was Sherry Cordova's team, I'm not 100% positive, but raised $13,000 alone by her team. Uh, that's outstanding. I mean, it goes to awareness, inclusion, inclusion, inspiration of the, from individuals with Down syndrome. The money raised will go to educational opportunities and programs for those individuals. And the idea was, and is always, to show that they're more alike than different. And it was, what an awesome event over at the baseball field for all the people that showed up and then the thousand people that came in and watched the game. Uh, really, really cool. Then our extraordinary Lobos, obviously there was a lot of families that had uh, were represented during the game. Our players took really, really big uh, pride in honoring those families. And at a later date, uh, we will award those jerseys to the families. They will get to keep those jerseys forever. Obviously the outcome wasn't what we wanted, but those the uh, deals were, were awesome. Uh, the student section, and uh, it started with Red Rally on Thursday night. Um, been talking a big deal about getting students to the games and doing those things. They were unbelievable on, Friday, on Saturday night. Uh, from where it started to, uh, Thursday, I mean, I tried to explain to our guys what Red Rally would be like. It was awesome. Uh, Coach, I mean, uh, President Stokes did a great job speaking at the event. I thought the DJs and stuff did a, a nice job of keeping that organized. And there was 3,000 students out there on Johnson Field uh, for the burning of the Aggie that we do every year that were having a great time and really did a great job uh, for our football team. And then the student tailgate, I mean, when we came over for our 10 o'clock walkthrough, was unbelievable in that parking lot over there. And then their attendance in the game. I mean, the Howl Razors and, and what they're doing, uh, I couldn't be more proud. Now, I made a comment at the game about being disappointed with the 27,000. That was not a comment as the football coach. I mean, it was an emotional comment, obviously. Not as the football coach being disappointed. It was as Danny Gonzalez, a Lobo fan, a local kid from Albuquerque, being disappointed that we didn't have 40,000 like I talked about on Monday. Had nothing to do with the people that were there. The people that were there were, were unbelievable. The atmosphere was awesome. Uh, it was uh, it was significantly a Lobo crowd. I didn't notice as many New Mexico State people in there. Their small section over there wasn't as big as anticipated, what I was expecting. So I thought our crowd, the people that were there and showed up were, were phenomenal. My disappointment was I want college football in this place to be 40,000 every single week. And that was my expectation uh, and my hope uh, and, and still my desire and my dream as this thing goes forward. But I want, I want to thank our uh, Howl Razors for everything that they did and their participation in the game. It was phenomenal. Uh, I thought the atmosphere started out great. Uh, obviously, it came down to five or six critical plays. They made them, we didn't. We had opportunities. We turned over the football going in with an opportunity to be up 10 0. Uh, we had an opportunity to pick six. Albeit the ball wasn't completely in his hands, but uh, Dante made a great break. Had an opportunity to go up uh, 10 0 right there. Uh, we missed out on four points on the first drive where we got down and then they got a sack. They made two great red zone plays. Uh, and then Dylan missed the, the glance route uh, just right behind DJ. So that was, uh, we kicked a field goal instead of getting the seven. And then the opportunity to uh, score a touchdown when you have the ball in the nine yard line and turn it over. I mean, there's 11 lost points right there. And then obviously it's been an issue. Uh, we gave up two big plays on defense, one at the end of the first half and one uh, as we cut the game to three with 10.06 to go in the fourth quarter. And we're gonna play man coverage. Uh, we're gonna continue. I thought Noah Pola Gates had his best game as a safety. Uh, they, they found Jamaris and they found Aaron on two plays. Uh, they're talented enough, they need to get better and they need to get better quickly. I thought not having Christian Ellis in the game the first half from the targeting penalty against Tennessee Tech really hurt our football team. Uh, Tavian was okay for about a half and then I decided Christian would give us a better chance and it came down to one play on defense. Now, give them credit, they ran the ball uh, in the second and third quarter. Uh, they didn't run the ball in the first and fourth, they ran it in the second and third. 
which kept them opportunities. And then the quarterback made some plays with his feet that were the difference in the game. Uh, disappointing outcome uh, because one of, of who it was against to the opportunity we had here. But uh, I like our football team. And uh, today was a good practice. We move on to UMass. UMass uh, is a team very similar to us. Uh, they're one and three right now. Uh, they, they've uh, done a good job recruiting in the transfer portal. They're significantly more talented than they were a year ago. Uh, Tyson Fomacon, who was their quarterback going into the season that played down at New Mexico State and got injured against Auburn. Um, I would anticipate him being back this week. Uh, Coach Brown is very close to the vest. Coach Brown is a, a veteran. He's a defensive guy. His comment every week has been, uh, it's early Monday. We'll see. Uh, so no idea. I mean, I can appreciate that. They're not leaking out anything from their media standpoint on whether it's going to be Carlos Davis, who's a big joker and can throw the ball really well. Um, Anthony Simpson is his number one target, and he's going to find him. Uh, they've done a good job. I mean, statistically, they're moving the ball all over the place. Uh, they've had a couple of turnovers that have kept him out of the end zone and in, in the red zone. Uh, from them, very easily could be three and one as opposed to uh, one and three. Uh, against Miami of Ohio, they uh, got down early 21-0. The resiliency of that football team, they battled their way back. They were down 31-28 with about 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. And imagine this, they give up a 70-yard touchdown. Uh, so it's teams, a uh, one-play drive, 70-yard touchdown. Two very similar teams uh, on defense, and, and Don Brown, who was the defensive coordinator at Michigan, defensive coordinator at Arizona, who's, who's been really good. He was the head coach at UMass, and they were uh, in, and in contention for a national championship at the FCS level when he was there between four, 2004 and 2008. Uh, they're good on defense. They're schematically good. They've got some good players. Billy Wooden, number 42, is a um, – Lack of a better word, he's a dog. He plays the game the right way. He's hard to tackle. He's physical. Uh, he makes a ton of plays inside. And then they're going to give us some different idea, uh, different looks in coverage. Uh, they are play field cover too. They're going to play man coverage. I mean, against Auburn, uh, similar philosophy that we took into Texas A&M. They played them man-man almost the whole game and didn't give up big plays. Auburn just kind of wore them out over time. Uh, they played them well. Uh, they were up. I mean, it was 7-7 early. And then Tyson got, Famicom got hurt, number three. Um, Carlos Davis came in and threw the rock a lot, and he'll continue to do that. Uh, they played; they put up a ton of yards and points um, against Miami of Ohio, and a ton of yards, and not as many points against Eastern Michigan. Um, very similar to us. I mean, they're they're finding ways to critically hurt themselves when those key plays of the game are coming. So you're going to have two teams that are uh, mentally in the same aspect. Which one's going to find a way in the fourth quarter? Um, I said it after the football game. I like our football team. And I like the guys and the resiliency of our football team. They showed up to work today, uh, showed up to work Sunday, obviously disappointed, but move forward to uh, have a chance to go play a football game this Saturday. We've only played three. We've got nine left. And uh, as hard as they work, it's a great opportunity before we get into league play uh, at Wyoming the following week. So with that, I'll, ask, I'll open up and make questions. Do you have any injury updates? Um, Tavian should be fine. Practice today. Uh, Luke Weissong uh, will be a game time decision. He's got an AC joint. Uh, he made two great catches. I mean, he was in balance on that uh, the one over there. We just didn't have, um, I guess they didn't have video evidence to show that he was in. I saw it, but uh, he'll be a game time decision. Um, everybody else should be ready to play. Connor, what's your Excuse me. Do you want to answer that? It's only Monday. Yeah, I should have. I should have said that. that was, that was, I mean, as, there you go. Coach Brown's a veteran. Um, Connor Whitoff is, uh, has an MCL and a an, uh, partial ACL that we're working on. Uh, he's not ruled out yet, but he won't be available this Saturday. Okay. And then the, so you'll just be working on that over the next two weeks? Yeah. Well yep. Forward. So we'll get the swelling out, and then we'll figure out uh, what he can do and then what the plan is. But we haven't made a definite decision on that yet. Through three games, you guys have, I believe, just three sacks right now. I talked to Tyler Drake a little bit. He generated a ton of pressures, but he talked about a ton of pressures against New Mexico State. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it was pretty clear, like, you know, we do feel we need to get home more. Are you kind of in the same mentality of how those need those pressures need to generate more sacks at this point? Oh, I mean, that obviously getting them behind, behind the chains with sacks helps. Uh, the biggest problem is it's not that we're not there. We're not making the play when we get there. Uh, we had probably six legitimate opportunities on Saturday. And give him credit, he spun out. We, we, we trained it during the week. He did a nice job of uh, evading the rush. Uh, 
we're not running through tackles. There was two of them. We had them in the grasp, and because we're going down low, instead of running through tackles, he was able to throw the ball away and, and get an incomplete pass. Uh, I mean, we're going to the, – the second half or the, the fourth quarter, we needed to get pressure on him to both blitz to stop the run and get pressure on him if he's going to throw it. it. It worked in the fourth quarter, but we gave up a one-play touchdown. So uh, – that those things will continue to come. I mean, we've had more pressure with a four-man rush than we've had in the past. We're not getting home. I mean, we're we're hitting the quarterback as he's throwing it, which is causing a lot of issues. Uh, but, I mean, it helps when you get them in second and 16 as opposed to uh, second and 10 significantly. On that note, I mean, I know you don't know which quarterback you're going to face, but, I mean, they do have a quarterback that is capable of extending plays similar to last week. you feel like you learned how to kind of attack a quarterback like that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they, they ran those same plays in the fourth quarter and it didn't work. I mean, we needed to make an adjustment that we made a little bit sooner. And then we made it at halftime. It took them two series, unfortunately, two series where they won. They were able to get a field goal uh, to in order them to not run the clock and, and get yards. I mean, they ran the first one down. He had three runs that were seven yards or more. Uh, the longest run being one of 19 on a quarterback scramble. Those were they extended drives to give them the ball down there in plus territory. And then we held them to a field goal. Uh, didn't run the ball well in the fourth quarter. They ran the ball really well in the second quarter because of how we were trying to we were going to. The idea was um, keep the ball out of his hands. Well, he kept it on a couple. and We missed a couple of tackles and forced him to run outside. Well, we did that in the third and fourth quarter, but he made too many plays with his feet in the second quarter and he really killed us scrambling with the football. So if Tyson Fomacom plays and he wants to run the ball, We'll invite him to. Coach, it is just three games into the season so far, new roster and stuff, but what are your key takeaways heading into Saturday where you say, all right, we need to fix this coming up on this date? Big plays on defense. Our safety room has to play better. Uh, the two Wolf safeties um, that are out there at the same time, they got to be able to play man coverage. Like I said, Noah Pola Gates played his best game on Saturday. Uh, he will be targeted less because he's playing good in coverage. I mean, he had the holding issue and the pass interference issue against Texas A&M. Had a PI against Tennessee Tech on, uh, I think it was the second or third drive. Um, after that, he's been stellar. Um, getting him in the right spot and, and knowing what to do has been the challenge. And I thought he was really good on Saturday and he'll be better again this week. That, that comes with experience. Jamarius is um, hit and miss right now. Both him and Aaron are kind of hit and miss. Uh, sometimes they have some really, really good plays, and sometimes they give up 75-yard touchdowns. We're not in a position to be able to do that and win games. So that has to be the biggest improvement uh, at that position. And then offensively, I mean, on the third down, they, we were 50% on third down on offense, and they were 22% on third down on, de on defense. I mean, we were able to get out the field in those situations. We've got to continue that as we move forward. You can't turn the ball over. Uh, East, I mean, uh, UMass is um, – opportunities against Eastern Michigan, they turned the ball over three times. Against um, Miami, Ohio, they turned it over four times. They didn't turn the ball over against New Mexico State. They took the ball away. New Mexico State against UMass turned the ball over. Against Liberty turned the ball over. Against us, we turned the ball over. They didn't. I mean, those were uh, – we had opportunities. We just didn't capitalize when, when they came up. I mean, we had the pick six. The very next play, Tavian Combs makes an outstanding play, strips Eli Stowers on the sweep. It was a double pass. Stripped him on the sweep and give Eli credit. Uh, he's laying out of bounds and he pulled the ball back in bounds, uh, out of bounds to retain possession. That was a really smart play from a true freshman. Um, we've got to capitalize on those opportunities because they're game changers. We would have had the ball right there on the 20 yard line. We'd have had a uh, walk in touchdown if Dante catches the ball. Um, it's not one person's fault, they're, they're team efforts, but we've got to make those plays in critical moments. <laughs> Coach, after having a game where the intensity level is so high, motivation level has to be sky high facing a state rival mm -hmm. now facing a team that you've never played do you have special concerns as a coach as to how to make sure they come out and understand that the level still has to be as high as i don't because of who this football team is and the the leadership and the maturity of this football team has showed we have not played we have not made the plays in critical moments it hasn't been from a lack of energy or a lack of focus I, mean, I thought, I mean, that was a great football game. I said it on last Monday, it's going to be a great football team between two good football teams. I still believe we're a good football team. We have to overcome uh, the things that are killing us. And I don't think that's going to be an issue on Saturday. You're going to have two teams in a very similar mindset going against each other that believe they can win a football game. Uh, 
the maturity of this football team and the leadership from Dylan to Jeremiah to uh, Cy to Alec to Tavian, those guys have done a good job. We need to continue moving that. CJ James, who's going back home, um, he's been one of our best leaders all season long. And so those guys, Tito Stafford, they've been they've been really good. And I thought we practiced good today. Um, that was because of the energy that those guys brought. And the other, the younger ones are learning from them. Coach, on the back end of that defense, uh, after the game, we heard a lot about the communication on the back end, just the importance of uh, those guys needing to communicate with each other. Is that something that you listen for in practice or you don't need to tell the guys, like, hey, be talking to each other, any more emphasis this week and really just in general? I really wish, Sam, that it was the Simon Ayers that were beating us. It's not. We got beat on a 75-yard touchdown in man coverage. The guy knew who he had. He got beat. Uh, Simon Ayers and, and those things you can fix with reps and stuff. Um, we need to grow up back there because they have enough talent. And I was, I've been in this situation before as a, as a football coach. In 2015, and I'm not comparing these two teams, but in 2015 at San Diego State, we went to play Cal. And we had a Wolf Safety um, who's like a son to me, the name Malik Smith. He was, what's the right word? He's probably as talented as any of the ones that we have on this team. He was playing as a sophomore. He gave up four touchdown passes against Cal, and we lose 35-7. Um, they wanted me to get rid of him and, and all those things, but he had enough talent like the ones that we're playing with right now. Uh, we played South Alabama the next week. Uh, Coach Vincent was on that staff. They beat us in, in San Diego. And then we went to go play Penn State, and they beat us 35-21. He gave up another long touchdown in that game. Uh, we didn't lose again after that. He grew up. We need those guys to grow up. They're talented enough. They need to grow up, and they need to grow up quick. Uh, like I said, I've been in this position before. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we can fix them. Uh, it would be nice if we fix them by Saturday. Uh, most importantly, we got to fix them before we get into the conference play a week from now. So what goes into that then? If it's not uh, anything like you were just talking about, what, what goes into that? Then? I've got an extra room in my house that they're going to live in for the next four weeks if they have to. I mean, it's time. It's, it's them coming over between class. It's them coming over and, and the fine details so that they know what to expect. That, that situation of the game on Saturday, uh, they were having success running the football with the RPOs. They've gotta, we've got to understand that that's coming. That's coming. That situation should have been known, okay, I'm going to cheat to head up inside because guess what? They're going to throw a glance route the way we've been fitting the run. He was away from the box. He's got to know that. That's experience, and that comes with knowing the situation. He won't give it up again. Unfortunately, when he did give it up, it cost us. It was a big part of the football game. I mean, that one play didn't cost us the game. It was one of six. On the flip side, you have a guy in your secondary as well that's you know doing pretty well. Uh, Dante Martin's only a couple of PBUs away. From Three. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just how much do, are you looking forward to him? You know, chasing that record and just you know just like having a guy like Cobra Quinn break that record. There's there's two th there's two schools of thought. He may not break it because they're not going to throw at him. If they're smart, um, he had, they threw it him on Saturday. It almost cost him a touchdown. I wish it would have. Um, Zach has gotten so much better that they can't go at him because, I mean, the very first play on the, the third down in the very first series, they tried to go at him, and he knocked it away. Uh, that pass interference down there in the end zone was an absolutely terrible call. That should have been on them. They threw down Zach Morris. Now there was an offsetting personal foul penalty that went along with that, so it was offsetting. I didn't think that was – I thought that was the wrong way. I mean, they were both hand fighting. Their guy pulled Zach by the jersey. So the limited opportunities that Dante's going to get, I really hope he breaks the record so he can just get it off of uh, – I'm the, maybe I'm the only one that gives him a hard time every week. But he's down to three and to set a record when you've got people like Brian Urlacher that played DB here, Glover Quinn who played DB here, DeAndre Wright, Eric Jack. Um, I mean, those guys who were, were really, really good, Art Hall, those guys made a ton of plays and have the opportunity to set that record – I think Dante's the best corner in this league, and I will argue that with anybody. After Texas A&M, uh, Jamarius Lewis told me that uh, you hop back into the safeties room with Coach House and we're working with them as well. House, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're doing the same this week, and what's kind of different in terms of working with those guys and teaching them that in that environment? I think Coach House has done a really good job. Uh, as, a, as a head coach, you get – I love coaching football. I love coaching kids. And I've done that for 25 years and been fairly successful at it. Uh, so that's our, our deficiency right now. And I feel that's where my presence is needed the most.
So we've been, I've been spending more time in that position meeting. Now I do spend time in other position meetings. Uh, but I think because of the young, um, the youngness of that group, it's probably where I'm needed the most. And so it's been fun. I mean, I like, I like coaching kids. That's why I do this. And I think the biggest thing out of not being a uh, head coach, uh, you miss is being a position coach. So it's been fun to be in there and talk to him. But I mean, Coach House has done a really good job and, and those kids got to live in his office in order to continue to get better. Longest road trip you guys are going to face this year. And then on top of that, you're also playing your first afternoon game of the season. Mm -hmm. um, how much does that kind of mess up the routine and how, how do you kind of just make things still feel like normal for the guys? Um, the routine of, of the game day portion is not bad. We come over every morning um, and do a walkthrough on game days that we play at night because I want to get them out of the hotel. Uh, we'll eliminate that. We'll walk through there at the hotel and then eat pregame meal and come on over. Um, it screws up the, the meal schedule a little bit for probably me and the coaches more so than the kids. Those guys will, would love to sleep as late as they can. Uh, we'll get them up enough time so that they eat four hours before the game and and go ready to play. I, every single kid on our team would rather play a 130 college football game. That's when college football in tradition has been played. So they'll be excited and, and ready to go. I think the ones that are hard, and, and I've played in one of these, uh, I think it's SC in Colorado or who's Colorado? Obviously, they play at 9 a.m. That's hard. That's different because um, you're eating pregame meal at 530 and and trying to figure out to to warm up and all those things at 730. That's different. Um, but playing a 130 game, now going all the way across the country, all right, here we go. One and 12 all time in the East Coast. The only win was in 1961. What's that? 111 all time, excuse me. It was in the Aviation Bowl. Um, does that matter? I don't think so. We don't play over there a whole lot. Obviously, in 125 years of football, we played over there 12 times. So we'll, go, we'll fly out there on Friday. We're leaving a little bit earlier than normal so that we can get there. Uh, the disappointing thing is the Friday night games that kick off at 8.30 Mountain Time won't start till 10.30 over there. So hopefully our kids aren't up watching football so that they're sleeping for the game. But outside of that, it'll be an opportunity to go play at 1.30 in the afternoon or what is it, 3.30 there in the afternoon, 1.30 our time, and, and go play some ball. It's not wildly pertinent right now, but there is no more war between D.C. and Devin on the depth chart at the moment. Um, as one, as D.C. kind of to plan himself as the true backup quarterback at this point. No, that must be a typo. We must have left it off on accident, Frank. So, no, there should be an or there or a slash or whatever you want to put. Um, and then I think for the second week in a row, uh, no offensive snaps for Christian Washington. Is there an update there or what's going on? Yeah, the guys in front of him are playing better. That'll continue until he proves in practice that he's better than the guys in front of him. They're not. We're having a ton of success at those positions. And when you have depth and success, uh, that's what happens. Give one of those guys, Dorian, his, uh, most carries he's gotten so far, he's averaging mm -hmm. over five yards a carry. Do you kind of expect more of an increase role for him? And what's been working for him on the field? Dorian's a really good running back. I mean, his vision is unbelievable. I and I give him a hard time all the time. I tried to convince him to come straight out of Cleveland High School to come here. Um, the junior college route might have helped him with vision and stuff like that. I don't think it helped him be significant because I think he's a really good football player. He was then, and he continues to get better every week. Uh, Bill is, is, I mean, in national statistics, he's one of the leading uh, in yards per carry. He's hard to tackle. So Bill will stay as long as he stays healthy. He'll stay the he'll get the main carries. Right now, it's Dorian that has earned the opportunity to have the second most and go in right away. Uh, we're going to see Andrew L Andrew uh, Henry is is finally I believe healthy. He looked really good in practice today, so he'll get a little bit of run. Um, Sherrod White, that was a great run. You can't fumble. I mean that was uh, and those guys have been significantly impacting our special teams as well. Uh, by far, I think that's the that room is really, really deep. So, I mean, it's a great competition every single day. Uh, Dorian is, has been the one that's been the best behind Bill. So he'll continue to, to get the second most carries. Uh, I thought in the second half, Dorian was, excuse me, Dorian got into a rhythm was really good. There's the one snap uh, for, uh, for Justin Holliday. Was that a, a goal line situation? Was that just mm -hmm. you want to get him in? in that um, if you all remember from last year when Justin ran the ball, uh, really successful, really powerful. Justin's strong. I mean, Justin has earned his spot as a deep, deep uh, the second uh, deep snapper on the punt team. Um, 
if Durkin slips up a little bit, Justin Holiday will be in there. I mean, because he's aggressive, he's big. And it was an opportunity to not put a beating on Dylan. Uh, Justin has the ability to throw the ball. So if they want to put 11 in there and in our goal line stuff, we can put him in there and he can fire it to one of those boys. Uh, I think he got hosed on that call too. I, I still don't know how they called him down, but um, that was a package that we had uh, short yardage goal line. Uh, and I dare him to put 11 in the box and, and touch Justin, Justin's arm. He, he showed last year that he can do some good things. So I'm glad he got the opportunity because the young man works his tail off around here. Is that it? You echoed some of the uh, sentiments around with the guarantee you had on Saturday today a little bit with a couple more days of digest to kind of think about it. Our expectation is to be in a bowl game. Our, our football team, I mean, that's the expectation of this program is to compete for championships in the uh, Mountain West Conference. Uh, I like this football team. I like the attitude of this football team. I like the resiliency of this football team. Uh, we have nine games left. And I, my heart believe that we can win five. We can find five and, and hopefully more and have a chance to compete at a high level in this league. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was really proud of Dylan standing up there because y'all asked him that question and he didn't blink. That's the belief of this football team. And it starts from the top. And I'm proud of the football team for having that belief. Now we got to go out there on the field and execute and prove it on Saturday and continue to prove it every Saturday. Uh, be exciting in, uh, in uh, UMass on Saturday. Uh, J.J. Buck calling the, the play-by-play uh, in place of Robert. A really neat deal. Robert, uh, his daughter's getting married. Sorry if I shared that, Robert. It's personal, but I think it's really neat. And Robert Bornoy is, is going to be at the place that he needs to be. And that's the right decision. And I'm excited for him and his family. Uh, on another note, uh, Fred Slow from the uh, two men on in the afternoon sent me a text message today about his father being in remission from cancer. That is absolutely outstanding. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in my faith and the power of prayer. Uh, so really, really neat for those families. And uh, we'll continue to pray for him. Uh, Coach Kill had an opportunity after the game to go see him. He took a big lick on the sideline. What a tough old sucker. Uh, proud of him for standing up on the sideline. I mean, he looked like a boxer. He had the bloody nose and all that deal. Uh, so give them credit. They beat us. Uh, had an opportunity to pray with him and talk to him after the game just to make sure that he was okay. Uh, I'm glad that he is okay because he's good for that football team. He's good for our state. Uh, obviously, we have a true rivalry because the two teams – I um, mean, they've beaten us twice and, and in, a, in a rivalry that we've dominated. So we don't anymore. So we'll have an opportunity next year. But I'm glad that he is OK from the medical episodes that he had last week. I mean, the stuff he's been dealing with for 20 years. Um, I'm just going to pray for him and, and continue. But congratulations to him. But more importantly, I'm glad he's OK from that. Um, really happy with the responsibility of our fans and how they handled the game. Like I said, I'm really proud of our student our students uh, in body from campus. Hope they continue to come over and, and support and show out like they did because I know they had a whole bunch of fun on Saturday. And uh, it's what I've been, what I've been asking for uh, since I got here as the head coach from them because that's where it starts. It starts with the students and our Howl Razors have been phenomenal for basketball and football, the way they showed out uh, and the way they did Red Rally. So, uh, Keep the faith. Thanks, guys. Go Lobos.